a prolific songwriter and three-time Juno Award-winning musician, Hamilton, Ontario's Tom Wilson has lived the life. You may know him from the 90s indie rock band Junk House, from Roots Music supergroup Blackie and the Rodeo Kings, or most recently, fronting the band Lee Harvey Osmond. It's been a successful road, but not an easy one, and he chronicles that life and how it needed to change in his new book, Beautiful Scars, Steel Town Secrets, Mohawk Skywalkers, and The Road Home. And it's a pleasure to welcome Tom Wilson. Hi. Hey, how are you, Nan? Thanks so much for being here. So you've had a storied music career. Um, we'd like to show a clip of you playing with your band, Blackie and the Rodeo Kings, performing I'm Still Loving You. That I wasted on you Come back to me, baby When I'm torn up and blue Oh, yeah Another day is through And I'm still loving you If you were to pick one thing I think this is like asking people To uh, pick their favorite child But writing songs or performing mm -hmm. For you, where do you feel most at home? Oh, um, there, there's, a, there's a necessity to perform. It's not just a ham mm -hmm. in me, but I really believe uh, if people sang every day, if people spent five, ten minutes singing right out every day, I think we would have a, a more sensible world planet to be living on. Um, I'd like to read a passage from your book. Oh, okay. And then we can, get talk, we can talk more about music. All right. Um, you write... I grew up in a place where I was encouraged to do nothing, to stay put, stand still, not move, lie low. Nothing was expected of me out there in the world. It was the 60s. Kids still wanted to be cowboys. Men were going into space. Kids wanted to be astronauts. The Leafs won cups. Kids wanted to be George Armstrong and Terry Sawchuck. Not me. All I ever wanted to do was to write songs, play guitar, and sing. That was it. That simple. When did you first discover music? Uh, well, it was around the house, Bunny Wilson. And that was your mom? The or woman, your adopted my mom? My, the woman who raised me. Mm -hmm. uh, she had like uh, Nat King Cole records, Glenn Miller, big band records. you got to remember, Bunny and George Wilson, the, the people who raised me, were actually my great aunt and uncle and were quite old, to tell you the truth. So their taste in music came from uh, a few oceans in time away, you know. So big band era was a big deal. Um, Nat King Cole, Ray Charles, um, those were the uh, singers and, and the music that I kind of first grew up listening to. Nat King Cole doing Route 66 um, is, is still, you know, so important to me. His voice. So those are the songs that were coming through. And the Beatles all of a sudden uh, were on the Ed Sullivan TV show back in about 63, 64, and that was, uh, was mind-boggling. I immediately grabbed a broom and... They were like, they had like groovy haircuts and matching suits and they had guitars, which I'd never really, you know, seen a whole lot of as a little kid. And uh, there's a lot of girls screaming at right. them. And I thought, this, <laughs> this makes a lot of sense to me, even as That's a four year old, I, I know. <laughs> That's what I want to do. I, w I want to have that. And um, I, I never looked back. It's all I ever wanted to do was, uh, was sing and uh, communicate that one. Listening to music, how did it make you feel? Uh, it delivered. It delivered me from, uh, uh, from, it's always delivered me from uh, wherever it was I didn't feel like I wanted to be at the time. Um, it was an escape? It was an escape when I needed an escape. I need that less and less now. Um, but uh, it, it it's, it's allows you to time travel in both directions. When you're younger, it allows you to dream. When you're older, it allows you to look back at some beautiful places that you've been. So how did you make the transition from fan to musician? I stole a guitar when I was 12 years old. I stole a guitar from Waddington's Music. I dreamed about having a guitar. I walked around. Before there was such a thing as, they said air guitar, I'd walk around playing the guitar all the time. And um, I had to get a guitar. I didn't know how to get, get a guitar. There wasn't a lot of money in our household. I was uh, conscious enough 
not to be asking Bunny and George Wilson for a guitar because I didn't want them to feel bad about not being able to get me one. So I just figured I'd steal one. And they had like a guitar lessons and you get a guitar to take home. And if you sign up for the guitar lessons, you get a practice guitar, so which was some... real crappy, crappy old plank, right? But so I, you got someone's ID? I got someone's ID. <laughs> I got a neighbor's ID. Uh, I went and bought him a pack of smokes, borrowed his ID, took the Hamilton bus down to Waddington's Music, faked my name and my address with, with just like, you know, a little birth certificate of his, and uh, took the guitar. It's funny, because I told this story. I was so inspired by the music that I was listening to, that I gravitated to, of Gordon Lightfoot, Bob Dylan, uh, Neil Young, and uh, I read from my book, the very first public reading I ever did was at Massey Hall uh, last September. And it was inducting Neil Young into the Canadian Songwriting Hall of Fame. And I, wrote, I, I talked about Tonight's the Night being so inspiring mm -hmm. and about it taking chances with music. And it made me want to play guitar even more. And I took that burning desire to steal the guitar. And I read that story to Neil Young and he thought it was so funny that not only did I steal a guitar because of his album Tonight's the Night, but I also stole a guitar and then took the bus home. You know what I mean? Usually, you know, that kind of robbery <laughs> you steal involves off in the dark. There's no getaway car, yeah. <laughs> well, in the book, uh, you wrote of two parts to a musician's life. Uh, one was a sex and drugs and rock and roll, mm. and the other was of uh, loneliness. Uh, how did one feed the other? Well, you know, there's nothing more. I mean, when I wrote the, I wrote this book, I didn't want it wasn't going to be a rock and roll memoir. In fact, I, I get kind of I get wildly annoyed, middle aged, annoyed <laughs> when people say it's a rock and That's roll annoyed. memoir. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It, it's very annoying uh, because it's not a rock and roll memoir. It just happens that I, I I chose to play music my entire life. You know, so I mean, obviously, I have to write about playing music, but I. I also, music had a, played a part in me driving my life into the ditch, right? Um, of, of having some kind of minor, minor league kind of fame and money and, and all that kind of stuff. I got a taste of that. I got a taste of private jets and all that kind of crap that means nothing. But uh, for me, um, it kind of was, it was a gateway. It was, that minor league fame was a gateway drug for me to uh, to be uh, basically take my life to the ditch. Well, I want to take a look of, at a picture of you. Um, mm. If you can look at the monitor, how old were you there? Uh, it's about I'm about 21 years old. I'm smoking a joint in the dressing room of Larry's Hideaway. I was going to ask you what you were smoking. Oh, it's weed for sure. Yeah, 100. percent And uh, it's funny because I I'll just I know you have uh, I know you have a line of questioning for me, but when I look at that picture. Um, you know, finding out that I'm a Mohawk. I mean, put that picture up again. It's like, that's a 21-year-old Mohawk guy. That's not a 21-year-old Irish guy by any means, you know? And you start, I start looking at pictures of me from the time I was a baby and, and through my youth and realize, wow, man, you know. It's interesting you're, you said that because throughout your whole life, you didn't know that you were Mohawk. No. And then you say, when you look at the pictures, you even, there's a passage in one of, uh, in, in your book where you make a reference to how kids would say things to you mm -hmm. uh, about how you looked. Do you think that you convinced yourself to believe what Bunny and George were saying despite what you knew to be true? Yeah. You can't fool kids, right? And uh, you can't fool kids on a playground. And it's funny how kids will go to the, the least creative form of an insult, which is a racial slur, you know? I mean, you know, um, racial slurs are just a sign of people not using their heads, you know? So I got, I got that as a kid, but it didn't really resonate with me because I kept being told that I was belonged to Bunny and George, who were Irish and French. So I thought I was an Irish and French kid until I was 53 years old. And then I realized, I found out that I was a Mohawk. Well, you've, we've talked a little bit, well, you've talked a little bit about uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, were drugs and alcohol integral to your performance back then? No, I, I, no I, I, the joy of performing music 
uh, I always try to uh, I always try to uh, embrace that the joy of performance. Although there was a lot of drugs and alcohol that went on. But you on. did say in the book that when you did eventually become sober, mm -hmm. that you wouldn't perform um, any other way after that. No, I mean, I was so connected to the groove. I was so connected to uh, what I was doing that it, it was almost like someone turning a light on in the room. Because I was drunk, you know, for years on stage or drinking or taking drugs. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't, I didn't feel that those things were a necessity to get me on the stage. They were just always around. They were always there. They were part of the routine more than they were a necessity. So it wasn't like liquid courage or anything like nah, that? Nah, nothing like that, you know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a knucklehead when it comes to doing things. I, I just do them. And, and now that I'm 58 and I, I just say really whatever I want, uh, you know, to say, I, I can only be myself. And with rock and roll comes women. Lots oh, of women. yeah, lots of women. It's like a, I think I said to you earlier, uh, it's amazing how good looking you get <laughs> when you put a gold record on your wall. It's crazy. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of you know, it seemed like uh, bikers and, and, and drugs and women that came through doorways with their clothes falling off them. That was a part of a life that... Uh, Looking back at it, I don't even recognize any of that. You know, I don't recognize myself, that's for sure. I, I sure don't um, recognize having uh, the, that kind of influence around me. You but know? you did meet one person that, turned, that changed the course of your life, Sandy. Uh -huh. um, how did you two meet? We met and how did bar. she change your life? We met in a bar. I think she was going to be going to law school at Queen's University. But she uh, introduced me to the idea of family. She recognized that... Um, that I didn't really have a connection or have a knowledge about how family worked, you know. I mean, I was raised by, you know, two loving people, my great aunt and uncle. But as I've said in the past, I didn't have that maternal bond with anybody. I think that Sandy Shaw recognized that. And um, we have two kids together. We're grandparents together. And we also, uh, uh, she was able to introduce me to the idea of family and the importance of it and what it meant to being whole, you know. When you found out that she was pregnant for the first time, though, you yeah. kind of reacted um, in a way you probably have thought about a lot since. How did you react when she first told you that you were expecting? Well, I was, I was freaked out. I was I think, 25 or 26, and uh, well, I guess that I wasn't. Uh, you know, some things uh, come to us uh, uh, in life at exactly the right time. We don't even know it because the idea of being a father at that age, uh, I, I ran. You know, I picked up and ran. But when Madeline was born. She and I have had a connection all our lives that uh, it's like nothing else I've ever experienced in my life. With my son, too. You know, so that connection, it, it took a while to get, I guess, the wrinkles out, you know. Um, I, I never uh, was a conventional father, I guess. I don't know. Was it hard to juggle fatherhood with music and being on the road? Well, my heart was always with my kids, you know. Being on the road was, um, was a necessity. And I didn't really even think of, uh, you know, in this business, in, in, you know, for me, I, I apprenticed. Uh, I started playing when I was 15. I apprenticed uh, 15, 16, 17 years, you know, before anybody was interested in what I was doing. I played through, like that picture of me at Larry's Hideaway. I went through, like, punk rock and folk music and just looking for an audience. It wasn't until I was 33 that... You know, we started to get, I started to get hits on the radio and, and all that other ocean of madness. You said that it took you 15 to 16 years to have any success. What kept you going during that time? Why not give up and do something else? Well, the burning desire to be able to communicate. To, uh, my, my journey in this life as an artist is to, uh, you know, it's not for fame and it's not for money. Uh, it's for the ability to be able to keep on creating. I made the choice to be an artist, and just because you choose to be an artist, like it's not a conventional uh, way of thinking, and it's not like you go to school and you know mm -hmm. people tell you how to be an artist. You have to find your way to do it, and sometimes you get dragged through the ditch and you get dragged put in the swamp, and sometimes you get ground under someone's heel into the ground, you know, and uh, 
uh, you know, the life of an artist is basically you got to sin to get saved in a lot of ways, you know. What was the music scene like in Hamilton at the time? Oh, uh, music scene in Hamilton has always been so interesting. It's been filled with daredevils and risk takers, um, people who were not necessarily interested in fame or money, but people who are interested in making noise, people who were uh, making music that was bounced off of uh, sideshow mirrors <laughs> and came back distorted. It wasn't what was happening in Toronto. Hamilton music seems to uh, look in other directions other than Toronto, not for any other reason except that we are influenced by Buffalo, New York. We're influenced by Detroit. We're also influenced by, for me, a strip of highway that leads from um, Hamilton down to... Highway 6? Highway 6, which I was, I was doing an interview with the BBC in London, England, and uh, the guy, the interviewing me, said, oh, you have quite a southern sound. <laughs> and I said, you mean like southern Ontario? And he goes, ho, oh, 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 ho, oh, ho, surely I don't know what you mean. I'm like, all right, let's <laughs> sit down and I'll tell you about this. And I started making stuff up. I, started, I made up the line, the Mystic Highway, right? But as I was doing it, it was like, wow, this is all real, because Highway 6 runs from Hamilton down into Port Dover, past that into Turkey Point. It runs uh, through the Six Nations Reserve, through the Mohawks, where Robbie Robertson spent his summers, where musicians who played music, rock and roll music, that wasn't heard anywhere else, that had great grooves, played people like the Bar Road Band, who nobody will ever hear of, that could kick serious ass and take names. And those are the kind of things, that being influenced, the Mohawk influence with migrant workers who were coming up to work, the tobacco fields, you know, there was, so there was this Mohawks and these island, these blacks from the island, you know, coming together. And all of a sudden, right down the center of it came Ronnie Hawkins, and the Hawks, Levon Helm, you know? These guys were traveling up and down Highway 6 playing Summer Gardens in Port Dover where all these great rock and roll bands played. It was an old dance hall that burnt down. It was on the beach in Port Dover. But I mean, it was like Ronnie Hawkins who fired his bass player Rebel Payne somewhere on Highway 6. Maybe they threw him out of the car, but they <laughs> found this kid who grew up in Turkey Point shitting in a Crisco can <laughs> who was able to join the band and play bass, and his name was Rick Danko. And all of a sudden, this sound was born to me on Highway 6 that gave birth to Americana music as it's known today. And you can take any other highways in North America, and they're no more or nowhere near as important as Highway 6 for the birth of Americana music, because everything about North American music sat south of Hamilton, Ontario. It was First Nations people, and it was migrants, people new to the area. It was all that mixture of sound and culture that came together. And then when you just put a piano and a bass and a set of drums together and some wild man to sing at the front of it, it I was, you. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was a different, uh, it was a different than what was happening on Young Street is all I'm saying. Well, you had bands like uh, The Hip coming into uh, Hamilton to see you. Do you think that um, when it comes to musicians in Canada, music in Canada, there is a little bit of an elitist attitude towards if you don't come from Toronto, if you don't come from a certain city, then you're just not paid attention to? Well, Toronto thinks that. You know, and, and, and way to go, because Toronto should be very proud of the music that comes out of this city. But when you think about, um, you know, there's great, there's great musicians that come out of Toronto, for sure. It's a beautiful city. It's... But do you think that Hamilton has been under-acknowledged? I don't know about that. We, we, uh, we just do what we do, right? I mean, Hamilton has never, has always struggled to be not a part of Toronto, and, and still, now that it's considered the Brooklyn of Canada, right. <laughs> now that it is almost, uh, you know, anyone will get punched in the mouth if they call us a bedroom community of Toronto, you know what I mean? Just because we want to keep that independence. We are a blue collar city. We, uh, we, we are a different 
artistic culture than what happens in Toronto. But listen, Ron Sexsmith's from St. Catharines, Ontario. Gordon Lightfoot is from Aurelia, Ontario. I mean, you can just keep going down the list of great Toronto musicians that aren't actually from Toronto. There's a lot of great maybe Toronto musicians. Maybe there's something in the water in Ontario, period, maybe. I think there is something, but I think that uh, remaining, uh, uh, you know, an outpost of major cities, and I'm not even going to put Toronto on, on uh, the name Toronto in it, but when you think about New York City, mm -hmm. you know, Charlie Parker, he wasn't from New York City. Mm. You know, Bruce Springsteen, he's not from New York City. Lou Reed, not really from New York City, you know. Bob Dylan, not from New York City. And the but list goes on and on. The list goes on and on, you know. Yeah. So um, what, what New York does to those artists uh, and what Toronto does to artists mm -hmm. is uh, completely its, its own story. Now, it did success, like being in Canada, did being successful in Canada translate to being successful elsewhere? No, being uh, successful elsewhere translated into being successful elsewhere. You know, there was a time, and, and this was part of the, uh, you, know, you know, you get sick of yourself fast, you know. I've been, I've been doing this book tour for a while and I never thought I could get so tired of talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> ever, you know, and and there's something about uh, maybe it's because it's not your comfort zone. Because if you were to do music, you would be you wouldn't say that, right? Oh, I mean, I like talking about myself as much as the next person. Let's face <laughs> it. But I'm just, uh, you know, it's, you know, come on. But I do notice that um, sometimes when uh, an artist or a band is successful elsewhere, like outside of Canada, then all of a sudden in Canada, it's kind of like, oh, we like you. Um, for example, like Drake. He was mm -hmm. more successful outside of Canada, yeah. and then all of a sudden it was like, "Oh, he's ours," and he's, you know. Yeah, well, Canada as as a whole is still, uh, you know, uh, uh, firmly under the heel of of the British Empire. You know, we're we're a country that when I was in high school, um, teachers were so so silly to uh, say that we were looking for what you know a Canadian identity is. You know, and we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to all, all the tr to all the trouble about questioning ourselves. British Empire questioned Canada. America questioned Canada. That, those, are, those are big questions. We didn't actually have to question ourselves. We were powerful. While well, people were asking what the Canadian identity was, mm -hmm. Hank Snow was writing great songs. Farley Mowat was writing great books. Mm -hmm. You know, people were making artistic statements. You can't, you can't find a Canadian identity or a cultural identity in the classroom. You got to go to an artist's apartment to find a Canadian identity, and that's that was a big mistake that, <clears throat> excuse me, Canada has made, and it's a big mistake that Hamilton, Ontario, refuses to make because uh, we refuse to be questioned and we refuse to change. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, slap us harder. We're not going to change. Why not, though? I think because... How do you stand up against all that? Oh, yeah, because, you... uh, because we have a confidence that uh, is, uh, is, is born out of, out of a burning desire to, uh, to keep going. You had a, uh, beyond having a successful career being in a band, you've also done really well writing music for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some artist called Sarah McLaughlin, uh, Mavis Staples, Lucinda Williams, all these great people. And now you're performing with your son. Mm -hmm. What's that like? Well, first of all, those people say, they kind of, we did duets and stuff, so mm -hmm. they sang music that I wrote, which was a real pleasure. But my son is probably, um, you know, there he's one. He's my son. Uh, not only am I proud of him uh, for the man that he is, because he's one of the uh, most genuine, calmest people that I've ever met in my life. He's like having your own Buddha. It's like I made my own Buddha to be with. But also, he's unbelievably talented and true to his craft, and it comes out in his voice and his performance that he's figured out as a young man what took me 56, 57, 58 years to learn, which What's is that? you can only be yourself and that what you have to offer, you know, is, is often the key to happiness, that that giving yourself over as a whole 
and only not trying to be anybody else or trying to be anything more is, is really important. He taught me that. He's just a kid. He's 25. It's interesting what you can learn from your children, right? Oh, man. That's why we have them. <laughs> now, looking back on your life, and you, you talked about the struggles you had to become successful in music. I don't know if that was your goal, to be successful, just to make the music. Yeah. When he told you that he wanted to do music, did you try to dissuade him at all, or is this something that you thought? No, he was just said he was born into it, you know? Mm. I mean, you know, my kids grew up, uh, like a lot of musicians' kids grow up backstage and in trailers, you know, and uh, tour buses and things like that, hanging around. So uh, that part of it, <clears throat> is not that big a deal, you know, but they uh, definitely have a connection with uh, the reality of what it is to be a performer, you know. Uh, they, they have a, they understand that um, artists, performers, people on stage in particular, um, they, they're not, they just don't come out of a box at the side of the stage and they're alive for an hour and a half, 90 minutes every night. They actually are, uh, it's, a, it's a whole day. And what was it like to perform with him for the first time? It's fantastic. He's the greatest singer. Um, there is a uh, connection that we have that is, a, I call it a blood-on-blood -blood connection because uh, I, I can't sing with anybody else in the world like I can sing with him. We're just connected. Tom, thank you so much. It's oh, been, thanks. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Great. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.